You know, finding high quality wireless earbuds without breaking the bank can be a real challenge, but fear not, we've got the solution, and that's today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon, co founded by the one and only Ray J, is on a mission to bring you innovative earbud design at prices that won't drain your wallet. They offer wireless earbuds in an exciting range of colors and patterns, and they're super comfortable. And that's not all, Raycon earbuds offer unmatched sound profiles for every occasion, from pure sound for podcasts and audiobooks to balanced sound for diverse music genres and bass sound for strong beats, so you can enjoy the perfect sound. Switching between the three profiles is a breeze. Just hold the L button on the left earbud for three seconds to toggle between the sound profiles. Plus, with stereo sound and passive noise isolation, you can enjoy your music and videos with that passive noise isolation. Plus, pair them once and they'll auto-pair for life with up to eight hours of playtime and a charging case that holds up to 32 hours of charge. You'll never run out of battery. Raycon proves that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for quality sound and essential smart tech features. It's a no BS product. Plus, you can get two years of product protection insurance for just a few bucks. Talk about peace of mind. And remember, Raycon has you covered with free domestic shipping and an easy return policy. And you know, look, not everyone is an audiophile or a tech enthusiast from the get-go. So for those looking to dip their toes into the world of audio, it might not make sense to splurge on a super high-end pair. By going for an affordable option, you can still enjoy decent audio quality without breaking the bank. It's a practical way to ease yourself into the audio experience without a hefty investment. Click on the link in the description box or go to buy Raycon raycon.com slash brain food to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring and now today's video. If you were to travel back to London around the time of the First World War, the scene would look surprisingly familiar. Aside from the Edwardian fashions and the absence of a few now iconic skyscrapers like the Shard, the city would look much like it does today. But at least one common sight would look distinctly alien to a modern observer. Large vehicles like double-decker buses driving around with giant canvas balloons strapped to their roofs. So what were these bizarre devices? Wartime camouflage? Avant-garde art installations? Half-hearted attempts to create steampunk airships? In fact, as ridiculous as they looked, these balloons were one of several ingenious technologies developed to get around wartime fuel shortages, some of which are still in use today. As a small island nation with relatively few natural resources, Great Britain has long had to import large quantities of food and other essential commodities from abroad. As a result, when the First World War broke out in August 1914, the German Imperial Navy launched a campaign of commerce raiding meant to cut the British off from their international supply lines and starve them into submission. While at first this was largely carried out by surface raiders following the so-called cruiser rules, the operation soon escalated into a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare, the first of its kind in history. With German U-boats sinking an average of 60 merchant ships a month by the end of 1915, Britain began suffering from severe fuel shortages in fuel. This, along with the prioritization of petroleum products for military use, left very little fuel available for civilian use. Indeed, in July 1916, petrol was officially rationed, with fuel tickets being reserved for key workers and a fuel tax imposed, which doubled its price to one shilling per gallon. Thankfully, Britain did have at least one natural resource in abundance. Coal. In 1799, a French civil engineer named Philippe Le Bon discovered how to heat coal to produce a flammable gas that could be used for lighting and heating. Known as coal gas or town gas, this consisted mainly of carbon monoxide and hydrogen along with traces of other gases like methane. Indeed, the high carbon monoxide content of town gas is the reason that people used to commit suicide by sticking their heads in gas ovens. While Le Bon failed to attract investors for his invention, coal gas distillation soon took off in coal-rich Germany and Britain and by the early 20th century, the industry was well established in both countries, with dozens of gas works supplying gas to even the smallest towns. Thus, when Britain was hit by wartime fuel shortages, it was only logical to adapt this abundant resource for use in transportation. But while adapting regular petrol engines to run on town gas proved relatively straightforward, actually storing the gas in the vehicle was another matter entirely. Unlike many other fuel gases, town gas can't be stored in pressurized cylinders. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, unless the cylinders and fuel hoses are manufactured to an extremely high standard of quality, the small hydrogen molecules will gradually leak out through microscopic cracks in the metal. Secondly, compressed and carbon monoxide causes it to decompose, making it useless as a fuel. Consequently, town gas must be stored at ambient pressure. In municipal gas systems, this was done using gas holders or gasometers, giant cylindrical reserves that telescoped to maintain the pressure of the gas inside. A similar solution was developed for vehicles in the form of large rubberized canvas gas bags mounted to the roof. While sometimes these bags were mounted in rigid and streamlined frames, most often they were simply secured using straps, giving the vehicles a comical, otherworldly appearance. 
But while the system worked, its fuel efficiency was abysmal compared to petrol, with three cubic meters of gas being needed to replace one liter of petrol. The average gas bag automobile held around 13 cubic meters of gas and had a range of about 50 kilometers, translating to 13 liters of gas per kilometer. The bulky gas bags also generated considerable aerodynamic drag, further dragging down fuel economy. For this reason, town gas systems were typically reserved for larger vehicles like double-decker buses or vehicles which drove short routes within cities like taxis and delivery vans. These vehicles were never far from a supply of piped gas and could thus easily top up their bags when needed. As the Bystander newspaper reported in June 1917, quote, the regular coach service twice a week between London and Eastbourne by Messrs Chapman and Sons of Eastbourne and Lewes was run at a cost of 10 shillings per day, although in ordinary unaltered petrol engines with coal gas fuel, 85% of petrol power has been obtained. The use of gas is still a matter for extensive experiment before it can unreservedly recommend it as a substitute for essence. Nonetheless, many different vehicles were fitted with gas bags, even, strangely enough, motorcycles, with the bag being mounted to a special sidecar. In addition to Britain, gas bag vehicles were also widely used in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. During the Second World War, vehicles fueled by gas stored in cylinders also appeared in France, though these used natural gas composed largely of methane, which could be practically compressed. However, these systems were far more expensive than gas bags and were relatively rare. While this technology largely disappeared in the Western world after the 1910s, in certain areas like Chongqing in China, it continued to be used well into the 1990s due to abundant local supplies of coal. And speaking of shortages and oddball car fuel sources, the outbreak of the Second World War brought with it a renewed campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare by the German Kriegsmarine, and Britain once again faced shortages of food and fuel. Later in the war, severe fuel shortages also struck Germany as military defeats on the Eastern Front and the Allied strategic bombing campaign laid waste to the Third Reich's petroleum supply, refining, and transportation infrastructure. With the majority of gasoline and diesel once again prioritized for military use, civilians were forced to cope with fuel rationing in a variety of ways, such as driving less or joining car-sharing clubs. As during the First World War, however, many also experimented with alternative fuel sources. But instead of municipal coal gas, most turned to a seemingly more primitive but surprisingly effective technology, the wood gas generator. As the name implies, wood gas is produced by heating wood or other biomass above 1400 degrees Celsius and, like town gas, consists mainly of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The wood gasification process was developed in 1839 by German chemist Gustav Bischoff, and by the 1870s, centrally produced and distributed wood gas was being widely used alongside coal gas for illumination, heating, cooking, and running stationary internal combustion engines. However, it was not until 1923 that French inventor Georges Imbert invented a gasifier compact and efficient enough to run an automobile. Imbert's gasifier consisted of four basic parts. The gasifier proper, where wood chips were heated, a heat exchanger to cool the gas, a water-based scrubber to filter out wood tar and other impurities that could clog the engine, and a specialized carburetor for feeding the gas into the engine. Like Philippe Le Bon before him, Imbert failed to persuade the French government of the value of his invention, but gasifiers were widely adopted in Germany, which had limited petroleum reserves but large supplies of wood. By the end of the 1930s, over 9,000 wood gas vehicles were in use across Europe, while during the Second World War, over 73,000 were operating in Sweden, 65,000 in France, 9,000 in Norway, 8,000 in Switzerland, 43,000 in Finland, and half a million in Germany, helping to free up valuable petrol for military use. These gasifiers came in all shapes and sizes, some being mounted in the trunk of the vehicle some on roof racks and others on small trailers. A number of vehicles were even factory built with the gasifier system pre-installed, such as the Volkswagen Beetle and Mercedes-Benz Type 230. To feed this enormous fleet, special refueling stations were even established across the country, dispensing pre-cut bundles of wood. The Germans also made use of their large coal reserves to manufacture synthetic petrol and lubricants via the Fischer-Tropsch process, with over a quarter of the Reich's military vehicles running on these fuels by the end of the war. However, this required large refining facilities that were easy targets for Allied bombing raids. In the end, a lack of fuel to feed their industry and armed forces was one of the major reasons that the Third Reich's eventual defeat happened. And when the war came to an end, and with it petrol rationing, wood gas vehicles disappeared almost overnight. By the early 1950s, West Germany only had 20,000 of them left. Yet wood gasifiers continued to be popular in several countries, such as Sweden, which, much like Germany, had no oil reserves but vast stands of timber. In 1957, the Swedish government launched a research program to develop a standard, optimized gasifier that could be fitted to a wide range of vehicles in case of a sudden oil shortage. The practical and theoretical knowledge gained through this research forms the basis of most gasifier designs in use today. Due to their relative simplicity and low cost of operation, interest in wood-powered vehicles regularly surges in times of fuel shortage, such as the oil crisis of the early 1970s. Today, 
Today, the largest single user of wood gasifier vehicles is the People's Republic of Korea, where gasoline is in short supply thanks to international sanctions. But before you run out to purchase or build your own wood gas car, know that while clean, burning, and cheap to fuel, performance-wise, these vehicles fall far short of their more conventionally powered brethren. The maximum energy density of wood gas is only 5.7 megajoules per kilogram, compared to 44 for gasoline, and it's very slow burning, severely limiting acceleration. To put this in practical terms, one of the most advanced modern wood gas cars was built in the Netherlands by an off-grid enthusiast known as Dutch John. Based off a Volvo 240 sedan, it can reach a maximum speed of 120 km an hour, cruise at 110 km an hour, and can achieve a range of 100 km on a single 30 kg load of wood, performance comparable to the average electric car. However, refueling the vehicle requires the driver to get out, chop down a tree, and reduce it into small wood pellets, a considerably more involved task than searching for the nearest charging station. Thus, while wood gasifiers might seem like the perfect way to break free from the tyranny of the gas pump, in reality, they're only viable in extreme circumstances when no other source of fuel is available. Available. Then again, would the Mad Max films have been anywhere as cool had its characters driven around in puttering wood-fueled Volkswagens?